Welcome back to our Med Smarter Lecture Series, where we're taking a smarter approach to preparing future physicians. Before we get started, if you'll take just a quick minute and click that like button, and also subscribe and turn the bell on so that you'll be notified when we post new videos. Let's continue on in our discussion of Staph aureus and talk about MRSA. MRSA specifically stands for Methicillin Resistant Staph Aureus, MRSA. So what's the big deal about Staph Aureus? Well, this is where we see a lot of our hospital acquired and community acquired infections coming from, from MRSA, as it is not sensitive to a lot of our antibiotics. Specifically, what's happening with this resistance is that this Staph Aureus has acquired a resistance by altering that penicillin binding protein. Specifically, it is a change in the MEK A gene, uh, which is from the staphylococcal chromosome cassette, which involves the penicillin resistance. So if we put a sample of this MRSA onto an auger plate and ran this for a sensitivity, you would see that there was no change in the growth around the oxacillin strip. And that oxacillin strip is a particular type of antibiotic and as you can see up here on the top, there's very little to no growth around that oxacillin strip. So this particular organism here is going to be sensitive to methicillin because the methicillin does not grow in the presence of oxacillin. But as we go down the strip, especially in these bottom two, what you're seeing here is that the presence of oxacillin strip on this auger plate makes no difference to the growth of this Staph aureus colony. So this is resistant oxacillin, which is what gives us the methicillin-resistant Staph aureus. Furthermore, Staph aureus, as we've mentioned, can cause toxic shock syndrome. So what is toxic shock syndrome? Well, it's classified as fever, vomiting, rash, desquamation, shock, and then end organ failure. What's happening here is that this Staph infection is causing all of these potential side effects, as well as AST, ALT, and bilirubin elevations, so it's also going to be affecting our liver. Uh, what is it most commonly associated with? Well, the prolonged use of vaginal tampons or nasal packaging. So using them for too long, not taking them out and replacing them, uh, both in the nasal packaging and the vaginal tampons, can cause toxic shock syndrome. As you can see on uh, this picture over here, this patient's hands have undergone desquamation, where they are losing that, or sloughing off that cell layer um, due to toxic shock syndrome. Let's continue on and talk about Staphylococcus epidermidatus. Staph epidermidatus is a gram-positive, catalase-positive, coagulase-negative, and urease-positive cocci that it forms in clusters. Okay, You can see that here in this picture. You see the clusters, uh, very small clusters. They kind of overrun into each other, but they're clustered up. They're not in a linear form. And if we are going back to reference back to our algorithm for gram-positive organisms, we see originally that they're gram-positive, they are catalase positive, coagulase negative, and then also urease positive. That helps us classify this particular organism as a staph epidermidis. One other no thing to note here is that it is sensitive to novobiosin. Also, it does not ferment mannitol. And a key factor for staph epidermidis is that it's a normal flora found on our skin. We have this all over us. It doesn't cause any type of a problem. It doesn't cause any type of an infection under normal circumstances. The problem comes in when it gets into a, in, uh, an area that allows that infection to settle in. So if we have an open wound, a cut, um, something like that, that's how we can get Staph epidermidis uh, causing an infection when it's always there normally. So what does this mean if it's normally found on the skin? Well, it can contaminate blood cultures, it can contaminate urine cultures, it can contaminate uh, swabs, that kind of stuff. So if you do a blood culture from a vein and you don't do a good job of cleaning uh, before we make that IV access, then you may have some contamination of staph, staph epidermidis in that blood sample. 
This also will infect the prosthetic devices and IV catheters. So it actually produces these biofilms that adhere to those catheters or prosthetic devices, and that allows it to grow on that particular structure. So we're talking about uh, IV lines uh, in your arm. That's why we change out the dressings often. Uh, if you're in needing them for extended period of times, we use different types uh, because of the risk of this staph epidermidis that's normally on your skin, potentially producing this biofilm to adhere to that IV catheter and then potentially get into the body that way. If you found this material helpful for your studying, please like and consider subscribing to the channel. Also, share this video so that more people can benefit from it like you have.